Well, um, a very good afternoon uh, from London and a very warm welcome to everyone uh, from the Bar Council of England and Wales. And I know I speak also for the Law Society of England and Wales and Simon's going to say a few remarks after me. But dear Bar leaders and uh, colleagues from across the jurisdictions near and far, it is a huge uh, privilege to be welcoming you to the opening of the legal year in London. Uh, it's been a tradition for many years for both the Bar Council and the Law Society to invite uh, colleagues from around the world to join us in London to celebrate. And under normal circumstances, we would all be meeting in Middle Temple, my inn, of which I am a proud member, uh, one of the most beautiful and ancient inns of courts in um, the world, I would say. And yesterday you'd have been in Westminster Abbey. Uh, as we know, COVID has been a huge health and economic challenge of our times, but it's also proved to be a trigger for innovation. And we hope that the innovations that have happened during COVID, not least of all in the commercial court, uh, will resonate for the future. Th that brings me to the theme of today's seminar, innovation in the field of international commercial dispute resolution in courts and uh, centres around the world. And that innovation has been accelerated by coronavirus. Our first session will consider the technological progress that jurisdictions have made, how they've coped with lockdowns and other restrictions. And the second will discuss how courts and lawyers around the world have worked to reduce the costs and the delays in commercial litigation. Well, that resonates very much also with the 125th anniversary of the Commercial Court in London. Uh, it has built up a great global reputation for resolving international commercial disputes. And it's remarkable, I think, to note that uh, two thirds of all cases in the commercial court have one foreign party and half have only foreign parties. That demonstrates, I think, the global reach and success uh, of our commercial court. And I'm delighted that Lord Leggett, who's going to make a, a few introductory remarks, is going to um, concentrate a little bit on that history and the standing international forum of commercial courts. Um, I, I'm not going to introduce him uh, because everybody knows him, but safe to say that he has been a, a appointed to the Supreme Court in April this year in a very low key way, um, much more low key than it should have been. Um, but uh, a bit like our opening of the legal year yesterday, nonetheless, a very important moment to mark. Uh, and you're going to be hearing from uh, many other experts uh, around the world and from here. Um, can I just say this? Uh, of course, we are incredibly proud of our commercial court. Uh, and uh, we have uh, seen over the years, many other centers adopting similar or, or uh, developed uh, ways of dealing with dispute resolution. Some of them based on our uh, way of operating. Uh, we do not rest at all on where we are. There's no room for complacency, but I think this is exactly the right kind of forum to discuss how we might improve things for our clients and for the delivery of justice. So I very much look forward to the discussions and it gives me great pleasure to hand over to my colleague and friend, Simon Davis, uh, the outgoing president of the Law Society. Uh, this must be one of his nicest uh, end of year tasks. Simon. Thank you very much, Amanda. And by out, outgoing, I think she means leaving rather than my personality. Um, uh, those of you maybe wonder, wonder why I'm wearing a slightly interesting puffer jacket is because the Law Society of England and Wales, which many of you, are, I'm sure, have been to, is being refurbished while it's happening. Uh, so I'm sitting in a room which presently has no heating. So the noise, which you may hear from time to time, is my teeth chattering. Uh, one of the success stories uh, of the pandemic has been the way in which the international legal community has spent so much time together, virtually, exchanging ideas and experience and expertise on how we've all collectively tried to support our local professions 
as they support the public in need. So during this period, I have been on a veritable magic carpet from St. Petersburg to Frankfurt to Paris to, to Washington via South Korea, all of which places in real life Amanda and I would have been visiting at some uh, particular point, but now we join them from various uh, parts of uh, London, North and South. Today is a fine example of the continuing collaboration. The Law Society and the Bar Council were there at the very birth of the Commercial Court some 125 years ago, and a wonderful partnership it has been ever since and continuing now. As you're going to hear from our panel, the range of technologies which have been used have been able to take one example, the Business and Property Court, to run 85% of his case that was a remarkable story. And today is the opportunity for all of us to continue to exchange ideas and expertise for the common good. So long live the international legal community. Thank you. Well, thank you, Amanda and Simon, for inviting me to give these few opening remarks. They won't be long. But not all of you joining this event will know about the origin of the English Commercial Court. And those who do, I hope, won't mind being reminded about how it came into existence 125 years ago in 1895. Sir Thomas Scrutton, a great commercial judge of the early 20th century, identified the only begetter of the English Commercial Court as a judge called Mr. Justice Lawrence. John Lawrence, who was known as Long John, I haven't been able to find out whether that was because of his height or because of how long it took before he would deliver judgment, uh, was um, not known for his legal prowess, uh, but was appointed to the High Court bench in the days when, I'm sorry to say, judicial appointments in this country were often made on a party political basis. His appointment was greeted with derision by the legal press. The Law Times wrote that it was, quote, a bad appointment, for although a popular man and a thorough Englishman, Mr. Lawrence has no reputation as a lawyer and has rarely been seen of recent years in the Royal Courts of Justice. It is said that he hoped more modestly for a county court judgeship, and when offered a high court judgeship, he was not sure whether to accept. He asked an old friend in the law who advised him to take it and added, Keep your ears open and your mouth shut and you will do all right. Lawrence followed this advice assiduously and for a while he did all right. But in 1891 he came unstuck when he was assigned to try a difficult shipping case uh, involving the law of general average. The parties were represented by leading commercial barristers of the time. The trial lasted 22 days, a long time in that era. Lawrence sat silently throughout, and at the end of the hearing, he reserved his judgment. The parties waited. Three months passed, then six months, then nine months, but nothing happened. Eventually, the parties respectfully inquired whether his lordship would be able to give judgment shortly. He said he would. On the appointed day, he came into court and gave an extempore judgment, which showed, it's fair to say, that he had absolutely no understanding of the case. This was the last straw for the merchants of the City of London who had already become dismayed with the delays, technicalities and cost of commercial litigation. In response to their complaints, the judges passed a resolution that there should be a commercial court for London. In 1895, this court was established and Mr Justice Matthew became the first commercial judge. Mr Justice Matthew was everything that Mr Justice Lawrence was not. It is said of him that he swept away written pleadings, 
narrowed the issues to the smallest possible dimensions and allowed no dilatory excuses to interfere with the speedy trial of the action. His judgments, concise and terse, free from irrelevancies and digression, won the approval of all who practiced in the court and the confidence of the mercantile community. The innovation of establishing a specialist commercial court has been remarkably successful. Our commercial court is no longer simply a commercial court for London. As Amanda Pinto has mentioned just now, our parties whose disputes are resolved here come from all over the world and often have no connection with this country other than the fact that they have chosen English jurisdiction. There are now, I believe, 12 judges who are authorised to sit in the commercial court, not to mention others approved to hear cases in the recently created financial list. During the last 125 years, and increasingly in modern times, many other countries have, of course, established their own commercial courts. And an important recent development has been the formation on the initiative of our then Lord Chief Justice, uh, John Thomas, himself a former commercial court judge, of the Standing International Forum of Commercial Courts. This held its first meeting in 2017. Its aim is to assist commercial courts in different jurisdictions to work together, to share best practice, and to support courts uh, in developing countries in establishing effective means of commercial dispute resolution. This international forum now has 40 jurisdictions uh, as members. The success of the English Commercial Court rests on two key features epitomized by its first judge, Mr. Justice Matthew. The first is the expertise and specialist knowledge and experience of its judges. Traditionally, its judges have been drawn from barristers who have specialized throughout their careers in commercial law. They now also include a lawyer, Mrs. Justice Mulder, who was previously a partner of a city firm of solicitors specializing in capital markets transactions. Not only does this experience mean that the judges have a sound knowledge of commercial law, but it also means, or should mean, that they are attuned to the needs and expectations of the business community. The second key feature is an emphasis on speed and active management of cases, directed at cutting through to the real issues in the case. This object objective is now a good deal harder to achieve than it was when the court was founded. There are many reasons for that. They include, I think, the much greater complexity of many commercial transactions, the huge volume of, volume of documentation, including electronic documents, that such transactions often now generate, and the human resources that are devoted in many cases to litigation in terms of teams of skilled lawyers when large sums of money are at stake. These and other factors make it much more difficult than it was for judges to manage litigation effectively and to contain costs. It is an ongoing struggle. Too often there is unnecessary prolixity and expense in the presentation of cases. Too often, I'm afraid to say, judgments are not as concise and terse as those of Mr. Justice Matthew, a sin of which I confess to being guilty myself when I sat as a judge in the commercial court. Clearly, we're not the only jurisdiction that encounters these challenges, and I'm pleased to see that this afternoon there will be a cross-jurisdictional analysis and discussion of reducing costs and delays in the commercial courts. I'm certain that we have much to learn from each other's experience. But first, there will now be a discussion of the use of technology in commercial hearings, with particular focus on hearings conducted remotely. That, it goes without saying, is a highly topical subject. 
since I took up my appointment in the UK Supreme Court in April, I've not yet sat in a courtroom or discussed a case face to face with my new colleagues. All our hearings and deliberations have taken place remotely and will continue to do so at least until the end of this year. That creates challenges, which I know have also been experienced in other courts here and in other jurisdictions, and on which we can again learn from each other. But that is enough in the way of opening remarks. I'll hand over now to the moderator for the first session, Stephen Thompson QC, who, as I recall, appeared as counsel at a remote hearing in June on an appeal from the British Virgin Islands to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council on which I was sitting. He has an illustrious panel of speakers, and I look forward to hearing uh, their wisdom on the subject of technology and remote hearings. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lord Leggett, for those uh, illuminating uh, comments and, and the history lesson. Um, as uh, those of you uh, dining in from uh, around the country and around the world will know, Lord Leggett himself was a judge of the Commercial Court and has been recently appointed to the Supreme Court following in the tradition of uh, the Commercial Court supplying a disproportionately high number of uh, high caliber judges to the highest court of the land. Um, we're also uh, joined today with two, uh, by two other judges uh, from the Commercial Court. Uh, Mr Justice Cockrell, who is the judge in charge uh, of the Commercial Court, who is on my panel, uh, and I'll introduce in a second in more detail, and Mr Justice Knowles, who uh, is also a very experienced commercial lawyer and commercial judge of the Commercial Court. Uh, that's the background of, of today's seminar, the 125 years of this Commercial Court, which has proven such a success and been emulated around the world, as Amanda uh, pointed out in her opening comments. This session, uh, we're going to focus on uh, technology and the background obviously is known to all of us, the need uh, uh, to move to these uh, very quickly to remote hearings of all different kinds. Uh, the challenges that that uh, threw up, uh, the success stories that, that we can take away from it. And what I'm going to be discussing uh, with the help of my very illustrious panel uh, is how different jurisdictions have responded to those challenges, what they have found works well, uh, what they think we might want to adopt in the longer term, what we might want to refine or reject, and, and what problems there are. There are undoubtedly uh, questions that have been raised about things like access to justice, um, delay, whether open justice is possible uh, online, confidentiality, confidentiality issues and, and maybe more mundane issues uh, to do with technological access. There's also questions about professional conduct and how uh, lawyers and parties might be best controlled, if that's the right word, um, on online hearings. Uh, these topics are going to be debated uh, with my panellists uh, who include, as I have said, Mrs Justice Cockrell, uh, the judge in charge of the Commercial Court list. She's taken up that appointment a couple of months ago and will be in charge till 2022. Uh, so welcome to her. Uh, and then uh, Olivier Cusset, who is the batonnier of the Barreau de Paris. Uh, and, and Mike Matthew Howard SC, who is the president of the Bar Association of Australia, and Professor Richard Suskind OBE, who is the president of the Societies of Computer and Law. Um, there couldn't be a more experienced panel to comment from different, their different perspectives on the topics uh, under debate today. And I'll ask them uh, to give a little bit more background about their particular perspective that they bring to this debate in a second. Just a mo matter of housekeeping, uh, we would very much like to have some time at the end of our hour to answer questions from the audience. But could you please, if you do have questions, use the Q&A function on Zoom, uh, and I will collate those questions and direct them to panel members uh, towards the end of the uh, or towards the end of the session. So please could you use that function rather than uh, any of the, uh, any of the other functions available. Q and A is the one to use rather than hand raising, for example. Um, so uh, perhaps I could just ask uh, my four panelists just to gi give us a, a, a sixty second um, outline of their perspective. Uh, not necessarily their views or experience at this point, but their perspective and how they come to the question of uh, technology in commercial hearings um, and what the successes and challenges of those hearings might have been. Can I start with you, Mrs Justice Cockrell? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Stephen. 
So um, I've, as Stephen says, recently taken over as judge in charge of the commercial court. Since the COVID crisis started, I've been sitting predominantly in the commercial court, but also on the odd occasion in our administrative court and in our criminal court of appeal. Um, the, I have been very busy sitting in all those courts in, in the time since the lockdown, hearing interlocutory matters, hearing appeals on points of law, hearing trials with and without witnesses. Um, some of those have been fully remotely. Some more recently have been in what we've been calling hybrid mode. That is where some participants are present actually in the courtroom and some participate by a video link. Um, as the new judge in charge of the commercial court, I have a major interest in finding out what other ways of working there have been around the world. We're quite pleased with how things have worked for us, but we're really keen to know what has worked for other jurisdictions and to learn from them. And particularly at the moment, I'm very, very interested to take on board and adapt for use all the good ideas I can, because if and when we return to normality, we won't be going back to life as we knew it before, and we must learn the lessons of this experience. Thank you very much, Judge. Uh, perhaps I can ask uh, Olivier Cusi um, to comment from his perspective, or just to just to outline uh, what his uh, his perspective is on this question. I think you're on mute, Olivier. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you uh, to the Law Society, and uh, hello, everybody. Just a few words. Uh, I think that in Paris, the situation from the pandemic uh, turned to, to, to make everybody in the justice community to, to, I would say, to jump into cold water because uh, there was no, no possibility of using uh, distance and remote uh, to, tools for the hearings before that date. Uh, it was the case in the civil court or criminal court, but also in the commercial court. It was not allowed. It was not used. So we need uh, we needed to turn to very quickly to equipments, very quickly to any kind of uh, of means. So it could be uh, contacting judges by phone or contacting uh, parties uh, by email. Uh, all kind of things. We were, we were not authorized because uh, the principle here in France is to use the court registration, which is a, an office that you have a public office in the public jurisdiction and you have a private office in the commercial court, but there is an office of the registration and the registers are needed to uh, use and to be a put and copy and dispatch uh, he, the, 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 the pleadings and so on to the parties. So I would say that the main and the most important and the, the first issue we are facing that we need to uh, pass by and uh, have the registry uh, not functioning for any kind of reason, I can explain later. So that was a way of a very uh, practical uh, agreements, practical uh, discussions between the parties, between the courts. And I have to say that the uh, flexibility and adaptation for the commercial courts in Paris and especially for the international commercial courts was uh, exemplary in that situation. We know uh, it's a real, real success and a real, real example for all the jurisdiction in Paris. Uh, thank you very much, Olivier. The, the Australian um, ex perspective, uh, Matthew, give us an outline of your um, experiences and perspective from there. Thank you very much, Stephen. And can I thank the Bar Association and the Law Society for inviting uh, me, the Australian Bar's delighted to be participating at such an important event. Um, obviously, um, talking about how the pandemic has affected the law has principally taken one to the technology. Um, as most people appreciate there's no one Australian jurisdiction. We have effectively nine different jurisdictions, each of the state and territories, and then the federal system. Um, so you'll be pleased to know I won't be trying to cover um, nine jurisdictions um, uh, this afternoon. Um, my home jurisdiction, Western Australia, um, is an interesting one because it has um, had perhaps 
the poorest use of technology in the superior and commercial courts. Um, but we're also in the blessed position at the moment of having no community transmission. And so life is um, almost normal um, here. And it's very interesting to see what that means for um, the first tentative steps that this jurisdiction took towards embracing the technology, um, comparing it with, for example, the federal system, which of course is working across areas which are in uh, quite severe lockdowns like Victoria, as well as um, jurisdictions that have opened up like my home ju jurisdiction. Um, so um, as uh, was said earlier, the federal system is not going back um, because it's um, perhaps been had, well, it's still in the process of using the technology, but in Western Australia, I think there are quite a lot of judges who, um, and the profession perhaps think that the blip has been overcome and um, they'll be getting back to the way hearings were always conducted previously. So it's perhaps at different ends of that um, spectrum that um, I can contribute something perhaps a little different to this afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. We'll be interested to hear about as many of the nine different jurisdictions uh, from which you have experience as possible. But uh, Professor Richard Siskind, uh, you have uh, been involved in, in a project this year, uh, actually trying to collate information from numerous jurisdictions. So you might even be able to beat Matthew's bit of nine. Uh, um, but, but from your perspective, uh, what is it that you um, view as the issues in this topic? Just a little bit of background on me. Good afternoon, good day to everyone. I uh, almost 40 years I've been involved with thinking about how technology might be used by lawyers and in the courts. So since 1981, when I was a law student in Glasgow University, I, I even wrote my PhD in Oxford in artificial intelligence law in the 80s. So sad career in a way, I've only focused on one thing and it's just a passion for improving the way we deliver court and legal services. I, uh, that my main interest really uh, for today is in the transformation of courts. I often phrase this in terms of a distinction between two forms of technology, automation and what I call transformation. Automation is what many people think of when they think about technology. You take some kind of pre-existing process activity and you streamline or optimize it, make it a bit cheaper by using technology, but you don't fundamentally change it. Transformation is using the power of technology to allow us to do things in entirely different ways. And so I wrote a book uh, at the end of last year called Online Courts and the Future of Justice, where I was trying to lay out not how we could use technology to improve our current courts and our current procedures and to make the people more efficient, but to rethink the way we deliver court service. And the fundamental question I ask is, is court a service or a place? Do we really need on all occasions physically to congregate to resolve our legal differences? And the answer to that question from most lawyers and judges until this year was court was a place uh, and of course a service too. But what we've seen through the COVID period is a remarkable shift, a move from court hearings in a physical setting to court hearings in one of a variety of ways online, which we can discuss. And yes, we set up remote courts worldwide that's remotecourts.org for those of you who want to see the website. And we have news there from over 50 jurisdictions about how they've been coping during the COVID crisis. I should say finally that I have been since 1998 technology advisor to the Lord Chief Justice. So I've advised all Lord Chiefs since Lord Bingham in the late 90s. And more recently, and during the COVID period, working closely with the senior judges in thinking how we manage our way through this very challenging time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard. You've got 40 years head start, or maybe 39 years head start on, on the rest of us, and uh, and and no doubt you'll be uh, impatient with the, uh, the the speed with which uh, the rest of us are are, are catching you up. Um, but but what I would like to do before we explore the future, before we explore um, how we might. Um, automate and or transform the court systems is just have a, a little bit more of a discussion with the panel on what 
they found in their jurisdiction went well and what went badly. Um, and I'd write, like to focus this discussion, if I may, not on the sort of purely uh, mechanical technological issues about people not muting themselves or un not unmuting themselves, uh, but more about uh, the more fundamental uh, problems that the remote hearings have, have thrown up, uh, but also the positive things that maybe the more cynical, the the the, the judges who I think uh, uh, Richard Siskin has described as sometimes hankering for the old days and hunkering down, might have been surprised by. Um, certainly, I have found uh, the, the ease with which um, the courts have adapted. Uh, commercial courts and the Supreme Court, in particular, have particular experience of those in lockdown and and everything from the bundling to the um, feed, to the, to the uh, consideration of the case was remarkably smooth. So perhaps I can just ask, uh, we'll start with the English perspective again and, and go around the panellists. I'll start with you, Dame Sarah, just on what you think went well or what you think went badly uh, when we were all um, thrown into lockdown in, in the spring of this year. Yes, well, I completely agree with you, Stephen. It was astonishing, actually just how fast things changed and how complete and successful the change was. Uh, by way of example, on the 18th of March of this year, we heard our full list in the court live. Um, as Olivier was saying, we had never done remote hearings. We'd done some video link evidence, but we'd never done fully remote hearings. We did very few telephone hearings. At the end of the day, we were told we'd have to try and hear as much as possible remotely. And by the 20th of March, we were hearing every single case remotely and we heard a full list. Um, in parallel, of course, our solicitors, who are a very sophisticated bunch, uh, like Simon, were looking at ways and means from their side, and they came up with alternative ways um, to Skype for business, which was our default. And we had the Coronavirus Act, which enabled live streaming. And so that gave us, within a very short period of time, a full portfolio of resources, which has enabled us to simply hear cases as anticipated. So when you ask me what went well, even surprisingly well, I think my short answer to that is simply everything. I'm as, I was astonished, I still remain astonished, that we managed to hear within the commercial court, um, we only put off four cases. Uh, those were all cases that had particular uh, reasons related to the party, so the court didn't put anything off. We have now heard three out of four of those cases, and the only one that remains has been held up by council availability because their diaries are so congested. So we heard witnesses from around the world, trials with witnesses from uh, two or three different continents. Uh, we've heard oral argument in very complicated cases. We've seen no drop off in work starting. Um, so everything has been almost business as usual. There have been differences, obviously. Assessing witness evidence is different when you only see the witness's head and shoulders. Um, it is different, as I'm sure you'll have encountered, Stephen, to cross-examine a witness live um, through a video link because you can't give those non-verbal cues to tell them to shut up when you want them to come to the end of an answer. Um, so there have been differences. It's more difficult to interact with counsel on debating points of law, going through authorities in an interactive way because of the time lag and the, the way that the technology works. But those are very minor problems. Everything else has worked very well. In terms of um, problems, I think we've maintained open justice, that that has been a problem in some areas where there have been technology issues for participants. In our court, that has not been a problem. We've even had far more people attending our cases than we would normally have done, and that has proved incredibly popular with our international clientele. We've had very positive feedback from them and also from the press. We've had some technical issues, if you want the downside, um, listing for multiple hearings when you've got the changeover between the different cases and there may be technical hitches can be a bit tricky. There can be particular issues such as when you're sitting partly in private and partly in public, how to manage that sort of thing. There have been issues of, about the ability of the judge to supervise the people participating. So. Um, if you can't see people, you can't see whether they're taking a photograph, you can't see if they might be trying to interfere with a witness, you can't see if they're actually behaving in a way which is inappropriate towards their counsel, for example, 
uh, trying to interrupt council when council is trying to make submissions. Um, so there is there are some problems like that, but really very few as far as we have been concerned. Um, thank you very much. Can I just ask you, um, as, a, as you're the only uh, judge I have on, on this panel, uh, just in relation to that point about cross-examination and assessing witnesses, um, do you consider that your capacity to, to evaluate the veracity of what a witness might be saying under cross-examination is, is, is impeded if you could only see their head and shoulders. And I'm thinking when I ask this question about the various psychological um, uh, studies that, that report that sometimes people are uh, um, confused um, by, by visual clues. And there are some studies, I think, that suggest that you might be better discerning whether someone's telling a lie if you only hear their voice and don't see what they're doing with their hands. Uh, hands or their body. Has it, has it been a, do you think it's been a real um, impediment to evaluation of, of truth telling in the witness box? Well, personally, I think not. I mean, I think you're entirely right that when one reads the science about the evaluation of witness evidence from body language and so forth, one has to be incredibly careful about putting too much weight on that. It is more actually about the perception of clients and witnesses themselves and we have certainly had experience of people who are going to be witnesses positively wanting to be seen live because they feel that their veracity comes over better in person from a judicial perspective as i'm sure lord leggett will be glad to hear um, i'm entirely with him on the uh, on considerable skepticism as to what you can get from a witness's demeanor and you know you get as much information which is probably as unreliable from seeing a witness through video link as you do in court. Uh, thank you that's that's fascinating I, I think probably those of us who practice and appear in in commercial courts might have a slightly easier time than than those uh, like Amanda who appear in criminal courts because um, generally speaking the cross-examination and the, the, the testing of evidence can be done against documents or lack of documents and, uh, and normally Absolutely. it's it's uh, relatively clear if someone is 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 uh, if not lying um, embellishing what, what their version of the history um can i turn to you um olivier could see could could you tell us what in in paris has worked surprisingly well and what what you think has been a problem before we talk about the future i'd like to just gather some experiences from around the world. So tell, tell us about France and Paris. Thank you. Uh, as you, you may know, certainly no, we don't have a, a cross-examination in our system. So, but the question of witnesses is, is an issue as well. The, the international courts and the commercial courts were very reactive. And the, uh, they, they took this opportunity uh, to adapt to the situation, to adapt and use technologies, as I said. And I would say that the first uh, impact, positive impact was the management of timetable. And uh, there is no, no so much delay in the turn to a technology by the, that kind of remote hearing. I would say more than that, the, the, this technology was used to, uh, to ask the question by mail or by phone before the, your, the hearings to, 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 to clarify situation, to clear any kind of contestation. And the judges were in a situation of interactivity with uh, lawyers and with the parties. So uh, I think that's probably the most important um, positive effect was a better relationship between judges and lawyers. We were put in a quite similar level of discussion because when you are in the physical world, that means that you, to see a judge, you need to, um, to have an appointment, to go to the court, to physically attend uh, somewhere, to wait for the meeting. And you are in a situation to organize in, the, um, in, this, in, in this kind of situation, a, a kind of superiority from the judge to the lawyer. In this uh, function, using technologies, we were all at the same level even in the same or bad level <laughs> using the, the technology issues, uh, meaning that sometimes it's not working and it's not working for everybody. So 
I think it was this, uh, this effect of um, creating a new, uh, a new situation, which is, um, I would say, more sympathetic and more human in the relationship between judges and lawyers. The, the effect on the decision, the effect of the quality of the, of the exchanges, the effect of the quality of the, of the judgment itself, I, were not so, so impacted. There was not better or not worse than it could be in the physical world. But it's uh, the, the good surprise, as we, everybody said, is that it works and uh, it has worked and, uh, and probably it was, a, it was not what we expected before. Some, some issues, I would, so some bad situation, uh, which are the dependent of this, uh, as you told about cross-examination, but it was, it was very, um, it's very sensitive for witnesses. We've seen that we can, as we do today, we can very uh, easily speak together because we have the same level of education in law and we are using the vocabulary, same vocabulary, or we can understand each other. When you have people from witness, which is a, a businessman, or it could be a, in civil court or criminal court, you have a situation where the, the people are not understanding well what they are speaking about, what is, what is happening. And in the, in the physical hearing, it's uh, much more easy to to, to, to take the, the, the hand or to take the harm of the, of the guy saying that don't say that or please stop or wait for, you, wait for your turn to speak and things like that, which is much, much more difficult when you are in this situation of uh, visio. So I think that's something we have to, 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 to take into account uh, because it's, uh, that's a question of access to justice. And the, the other issue we are faced with is access for public and access for press. Because uh, in, in a situation like a video conference today, you are making invitation, but the court must render the justice uh, in front of the public and for it's free, the, the access to courtrooms are free. So how do we manage with this free access for remote hearing or for video conference like that? That's probably one of the issues we have to think about. Thank you. Uh, Olivia, can I just pick up on, on on what you mentioned about the relationship between the judges and, and the lawyers in, in, in 2020? I mean, there are some people who have commented that um, one of the problems with remote hearings is that you lose what might be called the majesty of the court. The, the idea, certainly in, in our courts, that the judges is superior. Normally, the judge will sit higher than the rest of the the people in the courtroom and uh, so you have to look up to, to her uh, but you will also have the um just the sense that there that there is something um special maybe a little more aloof about the judge than the, the rest of the the lawyers and the parties um do, just listening to what you said about the relationship between judges and lawyers uh, you put it i think as a positive but th there would be a school of thought that said maybe that is a negative thing and there ought to be um, a professional judiciary which is seen as more important, a little bit, bit, bit distant. Yes, you're right. We, we need to keep this uh, ju judicial majesty or the judicial authority. Uh, I, I was not meaning about the hearing itself. I was meaning uh, all the preparation of the hearing where we were close together and closer than we were before in the preparation of the hearing, exchanging briefs, exchanging uh, schedules, exchanging uh, issues we could we have. So that uh, facilitated the access to the judge and relationship between lawyers and judges before the hearing. Thank you, that's, that's very helpful, a uh, fascinating insight from, from France. Uh, Matthew, can I turn to you, Matthew Howard, uh, SC, um, from Australia, what did you find worked well and badly? I think you uh, you suggested uh, to to us that maybe it would be different place, different uh, experiences in the federal system to Western Australia or other states. But uh, give us an outline of what went well and what went badly. Um, thank you. I think what worked well was where the court did not have a predetermined view as to which technology it was going to use. Um, 
so um, the federal court has settled on Microsoft Teams, um, but um, I think they were initially agnostic, but they found that that worked quite well for them. Um, some other state courts had bought some proprietary um, platforms before COVID and were reluctant to depart from them, even though they didn't work very well. And they didn't work all that well because they required um, all of the lines, which is old fashioned language, but all of the connections to come through the court. So a court might at any one time only have a certain number of lines, which has been perfectly adequate previously. But when you were trying to run multiple courts um, with multiple parties and witnesses, et cetera, it didn't, didn't work very well. So I think what worked better was using um, platforms that were um, readily accessible you know, by anyone, um, even if they were controlled, the access was controlled by the court in the ordinary way. Um, and I think it, perhaps less relevantly for today's purposes, but the courts that had mixed criminal and civil jurisdiction, um, I think really struggled because a lot of resources were going into trying to work out what to do with their criminal lists. Um, and in some cases, the civil side uh, was pushed back, whereas um, those courts that were only doing commercial matters or um, only civil matters didn't have that problem in trying to balance um, balance those. Um, I think what we know, and um, it's picked up in uh, the professor's paper, but I think what we know is that a, a visual platform is incredibly superior to a telephone or audio platform. Um, and I had the privilege of doing a three day arbitration by telephone and it was utterly exhausting, um, which is not to say that's the whole test of whether it's a good system or not, but um, it, it's remarkable how much more tiring it was that it was a telephone. So I think we know that we want to be able to see people. Um, so that, that works better. Um, courts that have more resources or had been using technology more flexibly previously did much better. Um, and um, those that had flexible um, and innovative leadership did better again. So in some ways, um, and it's not to take away from anything that um, the previous speakers have said, because we've had those experiences here as well, but in some ways miraculous that things went from woe to go as quickly as they did. Um, and in one of the federal jurisdictions, the administrative tribunal, um, the head of the administrative appeals tribunal was being told by everybody, oh, just put everyone on, put all your judges on teams. And it was an unresourced jurisdiction. And he said, well, we don't actually have everyone on uh, Windows 10. Um, so they, <laughs> so they, they had about three technological jumps um, before they could get everybody on teams. Anyway, um, there's some of the things that worked well and some that didn't. Of course, I know we're focusing on commercial courts, but um, what has not worked well and what we don't know the answer to is what we're going to do with uh, serious criminal matters that require juries. Um, that's a huge problem throughout all jurisdictions in Australia. Yes, that's, a, that's an enormous problem in England and Wales as well. And I'm sure we could have uh, at least another three hours talking about uh, that itself. Um, maybe we've made uh, today's task uh, simpler for ourselves by restricting it just to commercial courts. Um, I mean, it sounds, uh, Professor Siskin, from, from the practitioners and the judges who've been in courts as if they've been um, more positive, maybe su surprised in a way that you wouldn't have found uh, surprising by how well things have done. Uh, what I'd be quite interested to discuss or to get your views on um, is whether this uh, automation, which is, as you would describe it, which, which has taken place in the last year and has gone down very well in these commercial calls, whether you would be concerned that um, 
the judges and practitioners uh, delight at, at being able to to do things really relatively uh, cleanly through through these um, uh, remote hearings is is going to be um, a bar to what you would consider to be more transparent transformatory uh, changes. I mean, is it a bad thing that we have all um, uh, come through quite well in the last six months to the point we are today? I, I don't feel it's a bad thing that we've managed to maintain access to justice and in so doing genuinely to uphold the rule of law. I think if our courts had had to close and there was no electronic alternative, so imagine it was 1990 or 1991 or before then, we would really have been in a parlous state of near lawlessness if you can actually assemble in the way we've managed. What we have seen, of course, with COVID, and it's not just in the courts, it's everywhere, is both an accelerating and a decelerating effect. That's to say the automation, strangely enough, has accelerated. We've been using technology, essentially dropping hearings into Zoom, um, and that's worked well, but a deceleration in the interest in the interest in whether or not we might be able to adopt, as you say, and as I said earlier, a more transformational approach. Let me, Stephen, though, just take a little bit of a step back because I think it's useful perhaps to have a, a global perspective in this. So in remote courts worldwide, we see over 50 countries and, and they're reporting that they've adopted three broad options um, to what we call remote courts, uh, non-physical courts. The first is the audio hearing, and that was mentioned by Matthew in passing. Uh, the second is the video hearing, which has dominated this in all discussions. And the third is the paper hearing, where in fact there's no hearing at all, but evidence and arguments are submitted in the electronic form and the judge responds in kind and perhaps there's some kind of online dialogue. They're the three options that are available to us. And remember also, and this was hinted at earlier too, for both the audio hearing and the video hearing, there is the option between the, what I call the full hearing and the partial hearing. The full hearing where everyone is using video, uh, the partial hearing when there is a physical hearing, but some people are participating by video. That's a very different animal. So we've seen these three options play out. By a long margin, the most popular numerically and in spirit has been the essentially the video hearing. Very varying degrees of uptake across different jurisdictions. We're hearing a story in England, Wales and commercial cases, which isn't reflected across the world. There are many who have simply reserved this as a as a last ditch option where a case simply must be heard. So I, I, it's not the case across all jurisdictions that this kind of option has been accepted with unbridled enthusiasm. The way I would like everyone to look at this is we've had, and for me, it's really interesting. It's like a massive unscheduled experiment because we have been forced to work differently. And now what we have is a proof of concept and a challenge to concept in some ways, but we now have evidence of how we might work differently. I would say to you, I don't think there's enough research going on. Um, there's not enough data being gathered about what's working well, what's not working so well, uh, data that we could share internationally and begin to put together some kind of picture of what kind of cases suit what kind of technology. So I'll, I, I say to everyone, we're very much at the foot pills. Overall, though, I think it's worked far better than most lawyers and judges would have expected. If you'd said to most lawyers and judges in January, this is how you're going to work, they just would not have believed. And I've spent 40 years hearing from lawyers and judges how this just won't work. And so what fascinates me is that I wrote a book with a, one of my sons in 2015 called The Future of the Professions, where we looked across eight different professions and how they were embracing technology. And other than the clergy, we discovered that lawyers are the most conservative. And we can all have a little bit of a laugh at that. But conservative, actually, it transpires, doesn't mean not adaptable and not resourceful. Uh, because what we've seen, I think, staggeringly uh, across many of the courts in England and Wales, at least, and in many other jurisdictions too, is a remarkable adaptability. The speed with which many judges snapped into action, put together new protocols, practice statements, the speed of adaptability by lawyers and law firms, it's unprecedented. So while I do believe lawyers and judges are conservative, that doesn't mean if the platform's burning, we can't respond quickly. But I suppose what I've been trying to do over many years is say, actually, uh, 
in, in a rather ineffectual way, surely the platform is burning a bit. And by that, I mean, for example, only 46% of people, according to OECD figures in our world, live under the protection of the law. And that in most jurisdictions, access to the courts too expensive, too time consuming, unintelligible, and pretty much out of step in the digital society. These observations don't move the needle. When a virus comes wrong, the physical courts are shut. Of course, we need to do something. So I'm, uh, it's that old point about you don't want to waste a good crisis. The, the silver lining in all of this, for me, is it's opened minds and changed minds. All of that said, uh, and I should actually, one other point I wanted to make, because this has not been mentioned, is there, uh, and this is more informal rather than formal feedback, certainly amongst the global general council I speak to, who are talking about how commercial disputes have been resolved, there's a high degree of satisfaction with this new way of resolving disputes. And for the global general council, who are people ultimately who foot the, who foot the bill, this is a very important uh, feedback. Uh, what's not worked so well? Standard objections, I think, about open justice and digital exclusion are important. I think on balance, most people have, have said that open justice has been maintained. And indeed, feedback from the media is this actually in many ways improved uh, through uh, video hearings, at least. Uh, so that's been fascinating. Audio hearings have not worked well, and Matthew mentioned that point. The reality is, I I'm not a big fan of the term majesty for reasons we could discuss, but as regards the solemnity of the proceedings, as regards the judge maintaining control of the proceedings, in terms of actually having the sense that there is actually a genuine hearing going on, the audio hearing fails almost under all of these counts. But I should say, and certainly our lower courts, that's what civil judges, many civil judges have defaulted to because that was within their comfort zone, picking up the phone. They weren't confident to make that leap or maybe they didn't feel the technological support. But the audio hearing was for many months a default. Uh, I would also say, and this is a challenge, that I'm not sure all lawyers and judges have really embraced the wartime spirit. We've had quite a lot of judges and lawyers sniping from the edges, telling us the many ways in which this is unsatisfactory and less impressive than the real thing. Now, it just seems to me in the spirit of the times, that's frankly inappropriate. This is a time where we need, as a profession, as officers of the court, as lawyers, as judges, of course, uh, in their official role, to make the most of what we've got, to maintain the service. And so that's disappointed me a little bit. Uh, a minor point, it is exhausting, this idea no one is sitting for two or three hours and not feeling completely wrecked after. So I think we do need to think um, how we maybe pace ourselves a little better if you're sitting for, for, for many months. Uh, not all cases are suitable for video hearings. And one thing we haven't yet done, as I hinted at earlier, is differentiate where particular hearings should go and be supported by different technologies. I want to put it out there that I think a lot of feedback that I hear and have read is that partial hearings are, are not as good as fully video. So either you're all on together or all in a room together. What we often lapse into in the partial hearing is the video somewhere at the back of the room. You can't really see people and people in terms of the fairness of the process, don't feel they're fully engaged or part of it. So we've got some new thinking to do there. The final point I want to make, what's not working well in a sense, long route round to answer your question, is that what I'm seeing emerging is what I'm calling a new orthodoxy or a new conservatism. From many judges and lawyers who'd have said in January, there's no way we could ever use video hearings, and now hearing from them, this is the only way uh, that one, there's the only alternative. And so you're right, if, insofar as what I'm interested in, for example, is, asynchronous online hearings like paper hearings, uh, to some extent people's minds have been closed to other options because video hearings have gone surprisingly well. So the battle is still to be won. And the battle, frankly, is, is simply won about access to justice. It, it seems to me entirely reasonable that in a digital society, we should be thinking what aspects of court service should be, should be delivered digitally. And we've seen evidence over the last six months that we can actually deliver a lot more than previously was thought. Thank you very much, Professor Siskin. There's uh, an awful lot to, to chew on there. And uh, uh, I'd like, at the risk of uh, sounding defensive, to, uh, to, to suggest that um, certainly in this jurisdiction, um, the commercial judges and the commercial um, uh, lawyers have, uh, have not been sniping from the sidelines at all. And in fact, um, if anything, uh, we've all been positive. Uh, may, maybe uh, we were cynical at the start that it would be good, but it has been good. I think that, that's been the universal um, view of the practitioners and the, and the judges I've spoken to in, in this arena. Um, and again, at the risk of sounding defensive, I'm, I'm not sure we're that conservative either. Um, I, I do wonder, um, Mr Justice Cockrell, if, if uh, 
the, the, the commercial court that you're now in, in charge of is going to um, just uh, now be conservative, as, as Professor Susskind would say, and stick with what we've got, or whether there is going to be some refinement. I mean, obviously, nobody knows how long we're going to be in this situation. It's relatively easy to operate, we have found. Does that mean um, there aren't going to be any further plans for um, automation or transformatory uh, technological technological upgrades or or or, um, or are we going to keep pressing forward well i think we're definitely at the point of evaluating what we've got and looking to what we can want in the future um, we actually did a survey at a seminar that we did last month asking the customers the users of the court what they felt about different types of hearings going online so doing some of what richard says needs to be done and it turned back a result that for example 81 percent favored remote uh, case management hearings um, up to half a day 58 percent favored even more substantial interlocutories such as uh, summary judgments and and preliminary issue trials staying remote um, 80 percent again favored non-key witnesses going remote and 72% favoured taking a slightly nuanced approach, taking parts of trials remote. And uh, I think that, that is definitely something we're going to have to look at. And again, dig down into exactly what is best to take remote. Are we going to need to factor that into case management? So far as asynchronous um, online delivery, that is a different question as, as, um, as Professor Susskind rightly identifies. I have doubts about the efficiency of that in terms of the high number of cases. Uh, the great thing about getting everybody in court or online at the same point is that you are all focusing on the same thing. Uh, but certainly, no, it's not, we're not going to go ahead simply as we are. Um, we're not going to not ask the questions. We're at the start of the process of asking the questions. Um, and there's still, I think, quite a long way to go. There are other issues as well, of course, in how remote has it impacts on things like the training of young lawyers, which is a subject about which I feel passionately, um, and other aspects that we haven't really focused on properly yet. Uh, that's a particularly fascinating question, if I might say. I mean, we are here on the 2nd of October. Um, many uh, barristers are welcoming um, new pupils into chambers, and these will be uh, pupil barristers starting um, in their career, uh, sometimes having to start their pupillage remotely. And I think it's, uh, it, it's a very not question how uh, how we can ensure that those people get the same sort of training as their as their predecessors a year or two ago um, I, I want to leave a bit of time for questions and just to remind that the audience uh, if you do have questions please put them on the Q&A function not on the chat function um, I, I'm, I've noticed there are a couple of questions I'm not ignoring them but before we move to questions I just wanted to, to touch base with um, Olivier and Matthew uh, Olivier I'll start with you what what do you see in the next nine to 12 months um, changing in, in your courts? Do, do you think it'll just be carrying on as we are now in September, October, or will, will there be more um, refinements to the systems that the, that the users have in, in commercial courts in Paris over the next few months? Thank you. In France, the situation is that we, uh, after this uh, use of uh, video audience and so on, we, we turn back to the situation where law is today, and the law today is to say that the hearing could not be uh, by remote hearings. So the, we, are, we are in a situation of experimentation and evaluation of what we did, and if everybody uh, says that it was a real success because uh, we have no choice. For the future, I think that we have to think about um, maintaining the oral discussion because that is something where human uh, temper, the temper, the, uh, the atmosphere, and uh, the oral expression is uh, the, one of the, of the base of our work in front of the court. So I think that we need to define where and when it must be used or when and when it could be void and turn to something different. This evaluation is to be made today in Paris and we worked that with the jurisdiction. And in, uh, I also want to say in addition that we, we experimented this mixed situation Richard was speaking about, and mixed situation is probably the worst situation. 
because it's very difficult for a lot of reasons, uh, but it's very difficult to have somebody together in a room, together in a courtroom and other outside because that makes a kind of uh, uh, inequality of the situation of these and uh, that's very difficult to have justice rendered in the, in the better way. So we have these limitations to be taking into account, this limitation of technology, the limitation of uh, psychology. Um, that is something we are working, working with, with the court and with the chancery together uh, to define where we can use or not these kind of tools. Thank you. Thank you, Olivier. Uh, Matthew Howard, uh, see, uh, what, what do you think the courts of Western Australia and the federal courts in Australia will be retaining? And what do you think they'll be rejecting and refining in the next few months? Um, I think in the federal court, with its principal um, commercial um, and appellate practice, I think um, it will be it, it will be using teams or a version of it um, and refining that. Um, and um, so I, I think it, even in Western Australia where we could have physical hearings without there being any problem, um, the federal court is primarily doing its work um, on a remote platform. I think the point I tried to make before is in the state court, I think there's just an itching to get back to life as normal. Um, and so the things that uh, the professor was identifying, I think are exactly right. I don't feel at the moment that there is a groundswell um, to look at a bigger reform project. Um, I think it's a case of um, as soon as we can get back to what we were getting back to, then that's what we'll do. I think the federal, the federal court is different, um, but perhaps the place where there's more thought being given to the longer term reform in Australia, at least is the federal family court, um, which has been under such pressure as courts have right around the world with higher incidences of family and domestic violence and um, just the joys of people being locked up together. Um, and uh, I think that court is seeing as an access to justice um, that issue that the more options it can give to people to access the court, um, then it will actually um, be more true to what it's trying to do. So, um, but but I think I think if the professor was to look across Australia, his pessimism or his fears about um, the handbrake on any bigger reform project, it'd be um, probably realised at the moment. Um, so, as I said, the family, the, the federal court, I think, is doing it very well and will continue to do it well. But whether it's going to embrace the broader reform projects um, yet to be seen, I think. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Um, we've got a few minutes left and there are some uh, questions coming up, which I know the panelists can see. Um, I, I don't know the answer to, to Stephanie Hurst's question. I don't know if any of the panelists do. Um, those US commercial trials that, that are determined by juries, um, does anyone know how they're progressing? I mean, obviously, we have managed to sidestep the, the, the problem of jurors in, in, in our commercial courts. Um, I had an exchange with some American judges a while back, and it had led to delays for them. And they were looking into how to get juries back but I don't know what the recent update is. So they were all put on hold? I know of no full jury trial that's been held anywhere virtually. That Because there was a little bit of a movement, and it may surprise you, but I'm in opposition to this, of simply to drop jurors into a Zoom meeting like this and carry on. We have no evidence about the strengths or weaknesses of that. It just hasn't been done, it seems to me. Uh, to be too speculative to simply launch into that. The nearest that I know of internationally was in the Texas criminal trial where they actually did assemble the jury online, 
but the case itself, as I understand it, was abandoned. So it's early days for that. And Matthew mentioned it, but it is, as we're all lawyers and care, it, it really is worth saying that if the virus continues, one of the biggest problems we face in terms of confidence in the justice system is that we don't know how to conduct a criminal trial without physically assembling. And it's, it's, a, hu it, it's a huge problem challenge and there's been lots of work being done in our and other in our other jurisdictions to try and think this through. Of, of course we are now getting criminal trials here back up yes. and running with juries in much larger courtrooms yes. but uh, it is a logistical nightmare. Yeah. I mean parallel and or, or at least allied to that question of jurors and uh, and um, um, the jury is a, a unit that needs to be together to deliberate and to consider things. A group of um, 12 jurors are, are more, is more than the sum of, of 12 individual people, obviously. Um, but but a cousin of that problem that I noticed uh, reading the papers the other day is, is, the, is the deep need I think in, in, in many people to, to have their day in court and we sometimes use this in a sort of pejorative way but I was reading about um, the Manchester bombing inquiry um, and there were elements of that that were going to be done remotely and there were uh, family members of victims of that bombing who um, thought that it was um, really an injustice that they weren't being invited to be in the in the same physical room as the uh, as the inquiry itself and i think sometimes lawyers might be at risk of, of underestimating that even in the sort of commercial sphere um that there are cases where our clients rightly or wrongly um really desperately want to have that determination in front of a judge uh, and that sense of justice where you are all looking at each other across a room. Uh, that psychology is, 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 I think, sometimes forgotten. Uh, Professor Siskin, do you, I, I'm sure, have something to say on that. Well, I, I agree and I disagree. I think it is a very strongly held view, and I don't for a second want to challenge that that's how people actually feel. What will be interesting to know is, say, 25 years from now, if a new generation of people feel the same, because I was looking at Ragvesh's question about the symbols of solemnity in the state, like dress, the building, the formality, uh, clearly he, he, he or she regards that as fundamental. Um, and it may well be fundamental in 2020, but I'm not sure my grandchildren will think the same. I think our views may change over time because, uh, just one illustration, if what you are after is some kind of public ventilation or vindication, it's a rather close community, the physical courtroom, and most people who are, say, in their teens or 20s would regard the most public way of ventilating or vindicating is through online. And I'm not saying anything definitive here, but just simply saying we shouldn't bring our own preconceived ideas of what public means, because a 20-year-old's conception of public is very different from a 60-year-old's conception of public. And we have to, it seems to me, in designing our court systems. This is a whole new philosophy, seen best incidentally in the Civil Resolution Tribunal in British Columbia. I won't see an illustration of it working in practice. That this is not a system designed by lawyers for lawyers. It's designed very much with user needs in mind. And I don't doubt there are some users absolutely for whom public presence is absolutely important. But as, as Hazel Gen's research into why people go to law suggests, has suggested for years, Many people go, uh, uh, go to the law for other reasons. We need to have a deeper understanding of what it is that brings people to the public court system and identify those cases where public hearings are necessary and those where they're not necessary. I, I worry a little bit in the discussion, sorry, I don't want to dominate, but there's a slightly binary view as if there's a right or wrong answer. Surely what we're trying to do here is just understand the various services that a court provides and identify those where technology might do a better or a different, different job. I don't think we should think you can't publicly vindicate, okay, let's all go back into, into the courtrooms. And so, although I live at one end of the spectrum, I, I want to condemn too polarized thinking about this. Uh, I think if anything we've learned from COVID, that technology can be used in some ways. So I want to say, are there some other ways it can be used? Uh, absolutely. I think we can all agree with that. Maybe we need to adjourn and bring some 20 year olds into this discussion um, to see what their, their perspective is on that. Um, time is, is running out. Um, is there uh, any, any closing comments that um, 
anyone wants wants to make um, in in response to Professor Suskin's comments in particular or anything else we've been discussing? Um, no, I just, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was going to say two things quickly. I think the, the question that we've touched on is the ritual which aids the acceptance of the process and the people's acceptance of it. I think that's a big issue going forward and something we haven't talked about. I think um, the relationship between the bar and the bench and the trust that is built up over a period of time, um, I wonder what that looks like if people are effectively meeting and working with each other more remotely than face to face over a period of time. Yes, I think that's a, that's a very good point, if I might, might say so, Matthew. Uh, Olivier, final word from, from you. Uh, just to thank you and uh, say that we are all uh, working on the same issue today, which is uh, how can be uh, justice now in the world where we have so uh, so linked and so connection, so much connection. So I think that we we have a footstep forward that we can be we, we never go back again. I think. I think I think that's it's absolutely right that. Um, the requirements of justice can, of a fair hearing and what the, those involved need can change between different cases, between different parts of a hearing. And what we need to learn from what we've seen in COVID is that we can bring parts of um, what we have been doing into what we do every day when we get back to normal. Absolutely. And I... Uh... And I look forward to, uh, to the commercial court in our country doing exactly that in the next two years. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Justice Cockrell. Thank you, Olivier Cusi, uh, Matthew Howard, SC, and Professor Richard Suskind um, for contributing so much to um, this fascinating discussion today. And thank you uh, for those of you who listened in and sent questions. Uh, there's going to be what I'm afraid now is only a 13 minute uh, break. Uh, please don't log off or leave your Zoom call. Um, if you just stay on, uh, you can obviously, I can't stop you, um, you can go and get a cup of coffee or tea or a sandwich uh, or a dinner if you're in Australia um, and uh, you'll be back with the second session today, uh, chaired by Colin Passmore of Simmons and Simmons and with his illustrious panel starting at half past one. So thank you very much for everyone for joining us today and thank you to my speakers. Are we back in the green room as it were? I think so, yeah. Can I just say that was a great session. Thank you, Amanda. You did a great job. Can I just check? We are we're pro we're back in the green room, are we? So we're uh, we can. Uh, no, you are open to everybody. Okay. <laughs> I still think yeah. it was a can great. I, can session. I just say thanks, Stephen? No, oh, no pressure for the one thirty panel. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Add to that. It was brilliantly, brilliantly done because you covered such a lot of ground. Uh, and, and Richard, I don't know if people saw, because I was trying to send a message, but probably typo it wrong. In Scotland, they've just had their, their, are having their first remote jury trial with all the jurors sitting in a cinema, in the, the Odeon cinema. I was, I was, it was drawn to my attention by Amanda Miller in Scotland this week. I was saying no one was doing it. She said, well, look at this one, we're doing it this week. So it's, it's an interesting one to look at. Yeah, I have been following that. My point was not that people aren't finding very large buildings in which to conduct criminal trials, which I think is maybe the only alternative. It's just we haven't found an online way of, uh, oh, yeah. of, uh, of handling serious crime. And I'm not sure there is an online way. And what I was worrying about is if we have uh, an intensification of the, second, of the second wave and we can't even sit in these wider physical spaces, it's very, it's very worrying indeed. The Scottish uh, experiment is fascinating, isn't it? Because yeah, okay. uh, the idea there is the jury all sit together and they have what well, I would imagine in a cinema is a fairly wonderful view of the actual court. But this sense that I think was mentioned of the jury still being a, a group, as it were, is maintained. And that I think that seems some interesting follow. I'm, I'm told that there, there are huge logistical 
difficulties in setting up these large spaces at scale, but I haven't seen any studies of this. I'll send you the picture. I think it's too early, I think it's too early to, to say, isn't it? How, how um, but I mean, there's going to be, uh, by the end of the month, or um, as we're told, and I, and I think it's right, more courts that are capable of um, open to do jury trials than there were this time last year in England and Wales. So although there is an issue with multi-handers uh, for jury trials, there certainly has been a huge, huge drive to try to make sure that there can be um, the continuation of criminal justice. And as regards online, the points that were made, it was a different line of argument, but the points were made about people wanting a, uh, a day in court, as it were. I think many people do feel completely understandably, I suppose I feel too, that uh, for, for criminal cases, it is important that they're held in a physical forum. Uh, I'm absolutely not ready for online criminal hearings personally. But again, I can imagine my view on that might change over the next decade, who knows, whether or not it could be used in smaller, uh, lesser in respect of lesser crimes, I think. Well, it has. It has been in the magistrates' court. They have, right. they have had trials in um, uh, remotely. Mm. But I think one of the other things that um, is a bit of an issue, and I, I don't know whether you'd agree with this, is that when you have a Zoom call, everybody, you either have just the speaker or you have everybody in, a, in an equal way. And that is just not a replication mm. of a trial. And so your attention is oddly focused one way or the other, either only on that one person or on everyone um, at, in an equal way. And that just is not what a, what a certainly not what a jury trial is like. Uh, and I think it does impact on uh, the way in which you, one perceives things. I, I, I don't say that it's a disaster. It's better than not having any justice, but it's different. Yeah. And, and it has an impact on the uh, way that evidence and is received. But I think you well your point's just made. <laughs> and that's another one, isn't it? <laughs> I'm never gonna know, am I? <laughs> I was just making a point I can't wait to hear the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll see
Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back. It's it's one thirty, so uh, we will kick off with this second session. Now, the session is perhaps a little provocative, provocatively entitled "Reducing Cost and Delays in the Commercial Courts Across Jurisdictional Analysis." Uh, that rather suggests that some of our courts do indeed suffer from cost problems and delays. Well, let's see. What we're going to try to cover this afternoon is perhaps a, a little bit more positive than that, looking at how commercial courts across jurisdictions are managing to deliver justice cost effectively. And we're going to be looking at what techniques we are deploying and perhaps may be deploying in the future to ensure disputes come to trial quickly and with minimal costs. My name is Colin Passmore. I'm the senior partner of Simmons & Simmons uh, based in London. Uh, notwithstanding that, I'm still an active litigator. In fact, I've got a, a rather large commercial court matter still going through the courts. Uh, and I have had, as a result of that, experience of a hybrid trial. In other words, partly present before the judge, but mostly conducted over Zoom. Um, joining me is uh, the Honourable Mr. Justice Knowles, uh, a very well-known and experienced commercial court judge uh, based in our London Commercial Court. Uh, also with me is Marion Smith QC, uh, a London barrister and vice chair of the International Committee of the Bar Council of England and Wales. Uh, I have then uh, Willem Visser, who is the court registrar and the senior law clerk uh, of the of the relatively new Netherlands Commercial Court, uh, and last but by no means least, uh, and at a somewhat early hour, uh, Brad Rieger, who is the president of the Canadian Bar Association. Uh, and Brad, I think you've warned us that you may be joined on and off by a noisy cat, um, but um, we'll, we'll see how we how we get on. Um, what I what I want to try to do to set the scene for this discussion is 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 to ask uh, our panelists just to give us an overview uh, of uh, what goes on in, in their respective commercial courts. In other words, uh, what are the number of cases approximately that they're seeing come through each year? What is the type of case, uh, the size of the case, and in general terms, how long these come to trial? And what we're gonna to try to do is develop from there a discussion about, well, what are the uh, the problems that we encounter in these courts, what are the solutions that we've seen and that are working, what do we still need to do, uh, and what are the type of solutions uh, that are coming down the track. And if I manage the time for this correctly, I hope that at the end uh, we're going to have a discussion about whether commercial courts uh, should be making greater, if not compulsory, use of ADR and mediation techniques, uh, that's potentially quite a controversial subject. Uh, and I, I would also like to see if we can look at how we can improve communication uh, between the courts and the parties, which I know is a, a particular interest of, uh, of Willem in the, in the Netherlands. Let me start uh, with the Netherlands. And Willem, just give us an overview, if you would, of your commercial court, because the, uh, the information you gave me um, earlier this week in preparation for today suggests that in contrast to us in London celebrating 125 years, your commercial court is, is, a, is, is a very junior court in comparison. So why did the, uh, the Dutch judiciary, the Dutch government set up a commercial court? What's the thinking behind it and how do you think it is working so far? Uh, well, yes, that's correct. We start in 2019, January, so we're relatively new. Uh, I want to point out that it's not in, uh, the NCC was not set up as a response to Brexit. Uh, <laughs> the planning phase started in 2014. Uh, some European courts have been established because of that, but uh, we were uh, well ahead of that. 
um, it uh, uh, need for commercial uh, court uh, speaking English in the Netherlands was expressed by uh, international businesses and law firms in the Netherlands. Uh, they saw a rise in costs of arbitration and uh, of litigation abroad. And they said, well, we uh, like the efficiency of the Dutch courts, but the language is a problem. We have to translate all documents, have uh, interpreters stand on standby, while the most uh, staff of, uh, of our law firm, of, our, of our firms are uh, English speaking, the contracts are uh, drafted in English, uh, and that has, is not very efficient. Um, we agreed, we said, well, there is a need uh, for specialized judges. These commercial, co uh, large commercial cases need special attention, uh, need, also need uh, active case management. So that was one of the reasons for establishing the NCC. Uh, we also saw potential to attract cases from abroad. Uh, the Dutch judiciary uh, consistently ranks top five in the world. It's very efficient costs are low uh, and uh, the Netherlands is considered a neutral country if you uh, look at it from a geopolitical uh, standpoint. Um, so having uh, a Netherlands commercial court, an English speaking court also would have help uh, maintain the experience of uh, Dutch judges in handling international commercial, commercial matters and may also have a positive effect on the Dutch economy. So we started in 2019, had our first case three months after. It was very fast uh, in international standards because we're uh, a court that can only deal with matters if all parties agree that the NCC will deal with uh, the case. Um, so um, uh, now the cases are, are readily coming in. Uh, more and more contracts uh, contain an NCC clause. Um, so I, uh, we uh, have uh, big ex expectations that the caseload will uh, increase over the coming years. Well, uh, I'll come back to you uh, and pick up some of the points you made there to uh, see to what extent you looked at challenges that we face in other commercial courts and have tried to anticipate and therefore to avoid these. Uh, so, Willem, thank you very much indeed for that. Brad, can I move to you for a, a quick description? Uh, Canada is obviously a very well-known common law jurisdiction. Uh, judges in, in, in England will often look to Canadian authorities uh, for, for comparable law and how to decide uh, cases in front of them. Give me an overview or give our audience, if you would, an overview of how your commercial court system operates and the size and scale of it, please. Well, um, commercial courts are actually fairly unique in Canada. There is, um, there, there is really only two jurors. We have, a, we have a, a country with 14 distinct legal jurisdictions, uh, 10 provinces, three territories, and a federal system. It's really in an Ontario and Alberta where you find dedicated commercial courts, and even there, they're restricted to specific municipalities. So in Ontario, we have a commercial court, or what we call a commercial list, uh, for the Ontario Superior Court that only sits and only hears matters in Toronto. If you're from outside the Toronto area, you have to get specific leave from a judge to have your matter heard in their list. And then in Alberta, they have a commercial list, in, but only in Edmonton and Calgary. Um, the rest of the jurisdictions, uh, commercial matters are heard in the civil division of whichever Superior Court you have. So here in Manitoba, it's the Manitoba Court of Queen's Bench uh, that would hear uh, commercial matters. Uh, if you were in a federal court matter, primarily dealing with intellectual property issues, uh, it would be in the federal court trial division. Uh, so it's, it's, it's fairly unique here. Um, I know that uh, I, have, I have more information in terms about a Toronto, uh, at least the, the last report was that at least 50% of their matters were strictly commercial. Uh, as opposed to insolvency or estate matters. Uh, they had, uh, last year, they had over 5,000 matters um, filed with them. That's about 1,000 matters per judge because they have five dedicated judges on this list. Um, of that, uh, sorry, I've got a visitor. Um, of, of that, um, uh, they had 36 trials scheduled, but only six actually went to trial and had decisions rendered in one year. So uh, the statistics would seem to indicate that it has been a success. And in terms of scheduling, 
Uh, if it's a trial of two weeks or less, uh, they're looking at having a trial 30 weeks out uh, after discoveries. And if it's more than two weeks, they're looking at a trial being scheduled one year after discoveries, which, which uh, frankly is, is uh, the speed of light uh, when I look at other places. I just scheduled a trial last month uh, for five weeks and we have um, five weeks in May of 2022. That was the earliest dates we could get in our Queen's Bench here in Manitoba. Uh, well, there's, there's some quite impressive statistics there. Um, Marion, we, we heard from Lord Leggett a history of our commercial court. Uh, how would you describe how it's operating at the moment? And I'm conscious there is a commercial court judge sitting here listening to your answer. I will bring Sir Robin in in a moment. Give, give us your perspective as a, as a practicing barrister of, of how the London Commercial Court is operating. Well, let me start by giving some terms of reference here, because reflecting perhaps 125 years experience with a commercial court, we now have quite a number of courts that would be recognised as a commercial court globally. We have a financial list, we have mercantile courts taking lower value claims, we have a business and property courts umbrella which deals with uh, construction and infrastructure disputes in the TCC, the Technology and Construction Court. We have a Chancery Division and a Queen's Bench Division, which take heavy commercial cases as well. So let's just focus now on our commercial court. And, and I like Brad's, his cats, if I may, use of statistics. And I've been to see what statistics we've got available about the use of the commercial court, just the commercial court, not the Admiralty Court or any of the other ones in London. And the last full year we've got is, of course, the last year of the, of the old normal, shall I call it that, the pre-COVID. Although I gather that the trends are very much the same for this current year. So we have 830 claims issued, which is less than Brad was talking about, but they are joining an existing caseload. The same sort of hit rate in the sense that of the cases listed for trial, only 53 full trials were heard. That's a settlement rate of 60% between listing and trial. And I hope we pick that up and talk about that under ADR. Average trial length, nine days, but that's not taking account. And I'm sure the judge will be able to talk about the time that goes into the judgment writing and the pre-trial reading. Largest value of claim, two billion sterling. But of course, there are many claims involving insolvency where you can't put a value on it. We have 12 judges nominated to sit but they do also sit in crime and they help out in other divisions as well. So I think in fact, it's averaging about eight sitting full time. The all important lead time, and then Colin, you were talking about it taking years to get cases to trial. Lead time is, is not the time it actually takes. It's the time at which you can get a date for trial. When you go to the listing office and say, I've got a trial, when can I get my trial date in? Pretty much, Brad, I'm not sure Brad, we're quite, the speed of light that you were talking about but we have uh, one day to three week trials if you approach in September this year uh, trials dates available not before March 2021 now that's six months and frankly to get a trial a case to trial in six months you have really concentrated more than four weeks if you ask now for a trial date a trial date not before January 2022 15 months so not your three to four years, Colin, that you were talking about, but and not quite as fast as, uh, as yours, Bradley. No. Well, again, thank you uh, for, some, for some very impressive uh, figures there. Um, Mr. Justice Knowles, um, there have been causes, uh, there have been uh, elements of the trial procedure, the case procedure that give rise to delays. And I know a lot of work has been done to try to address those. And we're going to come on shortly to look at some of the more recent solutions, um, in particular, the practice direction 51U, which you've been so closely involved in. Before we do that, what is your perspective as, as a, as a London-based commercial court judge on how our system works? And is the slightly provocative title or the implication contained in our title uh, really justified that, that we have a system that is to an extent racked by cost and delay issues and I, I will pick up the issue of cost separately uh, in a moment. Thanks uh, very much Colin. I think the 
crucial thing about the title is that it identifies subjects about which we must continue always, all of us, to be vigilant. Yeah. Uh, we, we can't stand still. Um, the um, commercial court has been active, um, constantly active, to address those subjects. Um, it's able to offer a range of procedures from at one end what we call our shorter and flexible trial procedure through to our ability if a case needs to move fast of whatever size to entertain um, a sensible discussion about achieving that. Um, we offer um, a, 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 a range of ways to focus on case management, which can be a crucial component, not only to address these questions of costs and delay, but also to help identify the areas of the case that are most important on the statistics that have been usefully shared, it's important to remember that the commercial court is tending to take the cases that are of the largest scale. It's important also to remember that some of those cases are not just about money, that may be really huge, but they're about a point of market importance. Uh, that are about a point that is going to come up again and again and again and where a ruling is um, uh, uh, sought. And also there are a great many cases where uh, um, the very heavy battleground is at an interlocutory stage. Um, and I hope uh, in the spirit of endeavour that all of the jurisdictions present will share that one of the ways um, we can be vigilant, including about cost and delay, is to be continually flexible and to listen to users. Uh, that, that, is a, that is a very good point. And um, as I said, I hope, I hope we're going to pick that up uh, towards the end of this session, uh, because that's a theme uh, or a subject that I know uh, one or two others wish to pick up. Willem, can I come back to you? Um, when the Netherlands Commercial Court was set up, um, to, to what extent did you look at experiences in other jurisdictions? Now, I know that you don't have, uh, if I can put it slightly contentiously, the, the problem of disclosure uh, right. in, on quite the same scale we have. I'm, I'm going to come back to uh, certainly Sir Robin about this, uh, and I'll be very interested to see what the Canadian perspective is on disclosure. But what did you look at? Uh, in terms of what is going on in other uh, jurisdictions, commercial courts, and you decided that's a good idea, that's not such a good idea, we need to avoid that. Well, uh, I think we incorporated, uh, incorporated the idea of the English to do more on the, at the hearing than in written form. So uh, we, we uh, invite experts uh, to uh, uh, go into court, to go to the hearing, and answer our questions uh, there instead of in writing. And that helps, helps a lot. Uh, we've had okay, one case uh, already where we had a, an English barrister and an English QC explain the basics of, uh, of English contract law to us. Uh, we could also ask questions on the spot. It was very helpful instead of do it, doing it in writing, what is the, 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 the ordinary, uh, what, they, what they do in the ordinary courts. So uh, that's what we looked at. Uh, we also uh, looked at what, what other uh, jurisdictions, for, in, for instance, the US and the Canadians, uh, they also have a system where if there's uh, a, a case in case moving forward in both jurisdictions about the same, uh, they can uh, do a joint hearing uh, through VC, through video conference. So you have only one uh, uh, one date where both where the lawyers can plead, and the other uh, jurisdiction uh, uh, can can do it by a PC, and that helps also to bring the cases together 
<clears throat> more than it's, it's usual now. So that's how we what we what we looked at. Well, it, it sounds as if you should have joined in the previous discussion then, because it, it sounds as if you're using technology uh, in the way that we've all <laughs> become used to this year. Uh, that that that's very good to hear. Um, Brad, can I just move the discussion on? Um, obviously related topics, but costs before the Canadian Commercial Court. How do these work, both in terms of the cost of using the court, i.e. court fees, but, but more importantly, how does the court control the cost that, both, that, that the parties both incur and which uh, they are then liable to pay, if at all, uh, on, on the loser pays principle that still operates very much, uh, certainly in London? Um, there has been a lot of criticism uh, from civil liberty groups, uh, access to justice groups, uh, about the cost of litigation, um, whether that's in commercial civil matters, uh, family matters, um, estate matters, there, there's been a lot of that uh, complaint and that has led to changes in rules, uh, much more aggressive case management uh, by by the judiciary. Uh, here in our my home jurisdiction in Manitoba, we've come up with something called the one judge rule, where your matter comes in, uh, you will have three case management sessions. Uh, they will be scheduled. You will come in, uh, the judge will be very aggressive in terms of scheduling when people are to exchange documents, uh, to file affidavits of, um, of documents and exchange documents when they are to do discoveries. And by the third case management, uh, the judge is setting down um, uh, timeframes uh, or uh, setting down the time for trial. Uh, and what we, a new thing here for us here in Manitoba is that um, the judges will double book counsel. So if you go into a case manager, your third case management, and they say, well, we're gonna book you for April of 2022 for two weeks, and you reply to the judge, well, I'm sorry, but I have another matter at that time. It doesn't matter. Uh, that raises all sorts of interesting access to justice issues because you then have competing clients and also um, professional issues. Uh, you are then obligated to advise all counsel on all of your matters that are then competing that you are then double booked. So you have it. it this is a this is a when I say this is new, this is very new. Uh, it, it's basically in, within the last year, and uh, we really haven't seen the fallout in terms of what's going to happen. Uh, part of the reasoning of this is to encourage settlement. Um, I, I know that I was in a case management conference just this last month. Again, the same one I referenced earlier, where we are down for trial and uh, the judge put very specific time frames on us to have things available in mid-December and his comment off the cuff at the end was I'm going to make all parties incur costs now and that might make bring you to your senses and try to uh, reach settlement on this matter so it's a unique approach but uh, we'll see if it well, I, I, might, I might ask Robin a little bit later whether that's a technique uh, he, he is willing to try at some point. Can I just ask you to just give us a quick perspective from Manitoba on, on uh, how far, if at all, the loser pays principle operates? Is, is that a, a big issue? Is it something that sometimes litigants fear? If I, if I take this matter on, if I fight this application, I'm going to get a cost award against me and Therefore, I'm going to think twice about whether to resist. Well, I've, you know, certainly in my practice, <clears throat> I've always uh, heard people go, well, we're going to go to court and we're going to ask for solicitor client costs. And that's always yep. the thing. And um, it's, it's pretty rare that you get that. That's a steep hill to climb to, yeah. to gain a, an award of that. Uh, the costs are very much viewed as it's, it's really just a contribution. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're, it, it's a it's a very very rare occasion when someone gets a hundred percent of their costs. Yeah, well, Marion, we don't. Um, it's it's very rare as well that we get a hundred percent of uh, of the costs if we're on the winning side. But nonetheless, I think you'd agree that the the cost awards can still be pretty substantial. Um, is that your experience of commercial court cases in in London? 
I think anyone who tells their clients that it won't take time and money to pursue a commercial court is misleading yeah. them. It does. However well you manage it, however well you process it, it is going to take time and money. And for me, I think it's, it's a careful balancing act. We, we have to get cases scheduled for hearing. They have to be prepared well before they get into court. We can't be adjourning trials while people learn how to put the case. You've got then to encourage people to settle. Now, the art, the art of that moment of discussion is very difficult, too early, and people are just not ready to compromise. They don't understand the case. They don't understand the issues too late and costs are too big an issue. In, you know, in many claims involving very substantial sums of money, the costs quickly become, in my experience, the bar to settlement. I'd be very interested to hear if, if that's if that's the same experience that you know Wilhelm and Bradley you have as well. Um, just just before I bring uh, Wilhelm in, um, so Robin, do you, can I ask you? I keep using this word provocatively, but can I ask you provocatively? Do you sometimes sit there looking at the parties arrayed in front of you and think? Why are there so many lawyers in this room? Does this matter really need two silks, three partners, heaven knows how many assistants? Is, and, and is there anything you think that judges can do to try to control this other than in relation to the ultimate cost award? Because I, I think one of the features of our system, if I may say so in London, it is a Rolls Royce system. The quality is incredibly high, but that comes at a price, doesn't it? Th thanks, Colin. Um, what one has to take in everything. Um, and so, of course, uh, when one looks across the courtroom um, and there are, if there are a lot of lawyers there, that's something that one takes in. But uh, some of the cost is not driven by the numbers in the courtroom. It's driven by the work outside the courtroom. And one's got to be alive to that as well. Uh, it, there is so much at stake in some cases that uh, the cost, although substantial, um, is um, not disproportionate uh, given uh, um, what's at stake. But where you have to be really vigilant, I think, is if there is a disparity in economic power between the parties. Um, if um, the matter in issue is um, not one of wider importance um, and is um, hugely um, um, uh, 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 burdensome cost-wise if uh, medium or small businesses are involved. And that's why we in a sense, we, we have to approach this, not just by looking at the question of how much is the cost, but how can we continue to fashion techniques which will allow us to um, uh, re require participation that is at proportionate cost taking all these considerations into a, a, account. Um, the cost question um, uh, uh, worries me always. I think it should worry everybody in every jurisdiction. Uh, this is one of the areas where in a discussion like this is so valuable because it allows us all to hear about what each other is doing in the search for continued solutions. I was very interested in Willem's um, instance of how the Netherlands looked elsewhere before making some of the choices for, for their court. Um, and we will look at uh, Bradley's, we will all be looking at Bradley's um, uh, ju jurisdictions use of this aggressive technique. I, I've got views about it already, but we will all be looking at it because we all want better re results. 
Thank you. Uh, and Willem, just, uh, I'll give you the final observation on costs. Um, I was struck in your opening comments, uh, that, or at least I got the impression from your opening comments, that the Netherlands Commercial Court has been set up in order to attract work and therefore presumably foreign currency uh, as a means of competing uh, with other major commercial courts around the world. And if, if, if my impression is right, and please correct, it, correct me if I've got it wrong, um, what was the thinking about cost awards in, in relation to commercial cases in, in your jurisdiction? Uh, to what extent do you impose cost, award, cost awards or, or are you fairly light touch? Well, you're right. The, one of the reasons to establish the Netherlands Commercial Court was because of the rise in, in, in costs in arbitration and in uh, foreign, foreign, jurisdiction, foreign jurisdictions. Um, so uh, we uh, looked at how to minimize cost risks and how to ensure that the uh, exposure of the parties to a, a cost award are, is, is foreseeable. Um, so. We have a system of a flat court fee ranging from 7,500 to 20,000. And uh, a cost allocating system, a rate system, uh, depending on the uh, complexity of the case. Uh, so ranging from rate from uh, 1,000 to 12,000 per point. And a point is, is an action taken by a lawyer, for example, uh, submitting a statement of uh, defense or attending uh, a hearing. Uh, so you can, in advance, uh, uh, predict as a lawyer what it's going to cost your client if you lose. So that, that's, I think, an, an advantage. Uh, I've committed the, uh, the Zoom offense of speaking whilst on mute. Uh, none of us seems to rid ourselves of this bad habit. Apologies. Well, that's very interesting, and I, I certainly, for, for my part, would love to know more about that. I'm going to move on to uh, what courts are doing to try to resolve or have done to uh, uh, resolve some of these issues. Before I do so, can I just remind uh, everybody who's listening in, please uh, pose any questions on the, on the Q&A uh, part of the Zoom setup, and we'll try to cover those off a little bit later. Um, it, it's certainly the case that uh, in the English commercial courts, the scale of disclosure, uh, uh, problems caused by the prolific use of email. I'm of that generation. I can remember uh, litigating before email and mobile telephones even existed. I know I don't look that old, and thank you for not saying that, everyone. Um, uh, but, but the cost and scale of disclosure has been a big problem, uh, and I think uh, of late, uh, there's been growing concerns about the cost in, in England, at least, England and Wales, of the cost and length of witness statements. Now, um, let me just switch to Sir Robin. Sir Robin, you were part of, instrumental in the working party that formulated uh, PD51U. Um, it's uh, it's um, two-year experiment is nearly up, but I, I saw recently it's being extended. I don't think anyone is surprised about that. Um, rather than tell us why 51U came in, would, can I ask you to give us some observations on how you think it has operated? And has it achieved that change in litigation mindset that Sir Geoffrey Voss talked about in one of the very early decisions on 51U? I think the Sheffield United Football Club case. Uh, thanks. Um, the pilot uh, is to go on for a third year um, and that is unsurprising given that what this is all about is a change in mindset or culture. Um, we're not there yet but who would have expected us to be there at this point? The crucial thing is that it is an endeavour uh, that is purposed to retain disclosure. Disclosure is regarded as a crucial element of, of the search for an accurate and true result. And the other important point about this endeavor has been that it has 
involved everyone. That doesn't mean everyone agrees with it, but it has involved everybody from user to practitioner to judge. And an exchange of opinion, vigorous uh, um, uh, included. The elements of, of it, um, some will have seen, but just to put these on, on the table, include, for example, initial exchange of key documents, a focus on the issues in the case before one looks for documents, models of disclosure to enable a choice that can be geared to the importance of an issue, and in particular, the importance of documents on that issue. The use of technology to solve a problem that Colin said is generated by technology, the use of technology to solve that problem with um, not handing everything over to technology, but using technology um, to help with searching. A, a commitment to the exchange of adverse documents between the parties. And ultimately, the sixth uh, uh, element uh, that I draw attention to is a requirement of cooperation. And it's that requirement of cooperation that names the, the mindset that's required, the culture shift. Yes, we're in an adversarial process, but the adversarial process is not about the battleground on meeting obligations of the parties in relation to disclosure. The adversarial battleground lies ahead when we're arguing the points that matter in the case, factual or legal. If we're to have a viable system of commercial dispute resolution, we need more than ever the cooperation of the parties and their lawyers on the way to the battleground. And disclosure is a case in point. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I, I think there are shades of the discussion I want to pick up uh, in a moment about communication between the courts and the parties, uh, which you've alluded to there. Brad, two questions for you. Um, how do you, how, how does your jurisdiction control disclosure? And uh, can I also ask you this? I think when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, um, you said that the Canadian courts had had a COVID reaction policy, I think, of, of keeping the, the, the court show, as it were, on the road. It, are there any lessons from that that have particularly worked that we could look at in, in, in other jurisdictions, please? Um, I mean, a disclosure is, <clears throat> is mandatory in Canada, in, in, in all jurisdictions. Uh, you risk the ire of the court if you are playing games or <clears throat> attempt asserting, you know, improper allegations of uh, privilege over a document. Uh, the we have the same principles in our courts, uh, particularly in the commercial lists, that there is an expectation that all counsel will work cooperatively, and certainly. Um, Again, this goes to the larger issue of access to justice, where the legal profession has been called out um, as having an obligation to ensure that things move forward in a timely and cost-effective manner. Uh, and, and the courts have picked up on that and are holding counsel's feet to the fire to get, get things done, get them done quickly. Uh, and, and, and you will hear it from the judge if you are not doing that properly. Um, earlier on, I gave some statistics from the commercial list in Toronto, and I should say I, I have not received updated statistics uh, in terms of what has happened since mid-March, which is really when the pandemic hit Canada, uh, and uh, we, we, everyone kind of went into their, their dens, and uh, uh, we had to pivot very quickly uh, in terms of uh, delivering justice, uh, because court, courthouses across the country shut down. Uh, registries, uh, restricted access. Um, and what probably one of the biggest things that occurred was the use of video platforms uh, to conduct hearings. Uh, as in, in April, I did a scheduling uh, case management conference by way of tele teleconference. 
Um, and after it, I was wondering why haven't we been doing this all along? Rather than having to make my way down to the courthouse, go through security, sit and wait my turn, then stand up and speak to the judge, then go back to my office, I was done in 15 minutes. Uh, that saved my client a lot of time uh, and money for, for doing that. And so uh, we've established, uh, the, the, the Attorney General established a working group involving all the superior courts across Canada. The Canadian Bar Association established a, a working group involving the federal courts and Supreme Court, as well as administrative tribunals and, and pretty much all of our branches across, across the country established different types of working groups with the superior and uh, provincial and territorial courts in their jurisdiction just to see how things could move forward. Our Ontario branch actually made its Zoom account available to a number of courts in Ontario so that they could do hearings by way of, uh, in that case, the platform was, was Zoom. Um, a lot of people have said there's a silver lining to every gray cloud and that is we've, uh, our, our, our system has adapted um, but these changes now need to be made permanent. We, once this pandemic is over, we can't go back to doing things the way they were. I think people will be expecting that these uh, changes will be adopted on a go forward basis. Um, I think uh, given the time difference, you were asleep when uh, Professor Sutkin was saying virtually exactly the same. So I don't know whether he's um, sent you his script uh, but it's remarkable how the how the two of you are saying the same thing, but I'm not surprised. So thank you for that. Uh, Marion, um, wh what else is, has been a cause of delay? Can I perhaps suggest witness statements are, uh, a, a, sorry, not so much a cause of delay, a cause of cost. Uh, any views on witness statements and this new possible practice direction that is around but not easy to get hold of. I think it's 57 AC. There we are, look at that. <laughs> well done. I went looking for it and I couldn't find it, but I could find quite a lot written about it. Yes. And I, of course, it comes out of and reflects the report that has been put and accepted to the Commercial Court Users Committee. I've been very encouraged during this session that we've had today by how everything that comes back, every speaker comes back to access to justice and rule of law. They absolutely underpin everything that everyone on listening, participating in this session believes in. And so when you look at a subject like witness statements, you will not be surprised to know that we do have to look at both aspects because we've got the concern of our witnesses being used to say things they can't really remember. They're giving an aspirational recollection rather than their actual recollection. And there's a lot of work being done on memory. Plus, you've got the fact they're being used, certainly in the English commercial court, I think generally, sometimes as a vehicle for other work. They're being used as a vehicle for submissions. They're being used as a vehicle to write a long commentary on the documents. For a witness, and frankly, all witnesses now, if you look at what they write, they sound like Lady Bracknell, don't they? They've all got a beautiful version of English, which when they stand up in the box and to start answering questions, is not necessarily what they actually have. So what we're doing here is we're looking um, at just reminding everyone of what the rules are when it comes to the content of a witness statement. We are changing how the witness statement is to be taken. And there's some very interesting ideas coming out of that with people being restricted as to what they can show the witness. But if we look at the content of it, they're all being reminded of the basic rules. It's our don't drink bleach moment. You wouldn't think you have to say it, but you do. So witnesses are only to give evidence about what they can speak to properly. It's not acceptable to provide a lengthy commentary on disclosure documents. It shouldn't be used for the purposes of submission and they should be as concise as possible without omitting anything of significance. About which I've got this to say, yes, it's right. Call it out when it goes wrong. But just remember what Churchill said when explaining why he wrote a long letter. I haven't got the time to write a short yeah. one. Sometimes concision comes at a price. And if you take th this material out of the witness statement, which you should, it's gonna have to go somewhere. Yeah. And I think there's a risk we're gonna have longer openings and we're gonna have longer submissions. So it's always gonna be a, 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 holistic, yeah. a holistic battle, isn't it? Yeah. Keep... You're not an advocate then of the witnesses writing their own witness statements? Oh, good Lord, no. Uh, I'm right answer, if I may say so. <laughs> right, um, given the time, I'm going to move on. I do want to cover the subject 
uh, of communication between the court and the parties. And I do want to leave a little bit of time to talk about ADR because I'd like to leave, uh, or I'd like us to finish, subject to any questions coming through uh, on what I'm sure is a, is, is a mildly contentious subject, or maybe it won't be. Um, Willem, you uh, said that you had some views, possibly some strong views on the importance of the relationship between the court, uh, someone in your position and the parties. Just quickly share those with us. And I'd like then to segue into Sir Robin, who uh, I think has also just said uh, and, and has practiced um, the, the importance of listening to what the parties are saying. Right. Court users are saying. So over to you, Will. Thank you. Uh, well, communication is one of the basic issues and which can cause delays or speed up the process, I think. Uh, and so what we did uh, from the outset is to uh, designate a judge and a clerk to a specific case when it comes in. When the writ of summons is entered into our digital portal, uh, a judge and clerk are designated and they are looking at the, the, the document uh, as soon as possible and then decide on what to do. Um, mostly, usually it will be uh, scheduling a case conference, a management case conference, um, to uh, set a timeline um, and then sticking to it also. Uh, so no extensions for uh, granted to the parties from that timeline. That helps speed up things as well. Um, video conference makes it easier to schedule uh, case management hearings and, and ordinary hearings. Uh, we have experimented sin, uh, with that from COVID uh, outbreak uh, and it works very well. Um, uh, so I've had one case, uh, a summary proceedings case, uh, also about COVID actually and, and breaking a, a breakup fee uh, of a management and a M&A contract uh, where we, what we dealt with in seven weeks and had one uh, management case conference and two uh, hearings within that time frame and a judgment. So it can be very uh, uh, helpful if you use video conference for, for, uh, for guiding your, your, your uh, case through court. Um, I, I already talked about the foreign counsel and experts that we allowed to speak. Uh, we have a digital communication platform, uh, ENCC, where you can submit all your documents and messages, messages to, the, to the court, to the other party. It's an easy to use uh, upload download portal and uh, what's one of the uh, benefits is that um, if a message is uploaded into the portal, the designated judge and clerk uh, get a message that something happened in their case and they can look at the message instantly and respond within a reasonable time. Whereas in ordinary courts, uh, those messages are in writing to the administrative clerks, they go to the procedural judge if there's no case judge yet. And then he looks at it uh, uh, five days or in, in the response by, by in writing. So that calls for very um, uh, many delays and uh, this uh, digital portal helps to speed up that process as well. Thank you. So Robin, were, were, you, were your comments earlier more about uh, listening to user feedback via, for example, the Commercial Court Users Committee and, and bodies of that sort. Are, are they important to you and your fellow judges? Uh, very much so. Um, although I recognise everything that Willem has said, um, it's interesting and right that we call some of the case-specific exchanges between judges and parties and their lawyers conferences so that there can be communication and discussion to map a sensible path. But at broader scale, uh, the commercial court owes a great deal of what it is today and actually where it began to its users. Um, and the commercial court users committee is a, a crucial in instrument. Around the users committee table are not just the lawyers, they are the market associations uh, and uh, others from the um, uh, uh, client community um, who can uh, discuss the broad themes that will lead to continued improvement. Our financial list mentioned earlier came really in response to uh, user suggestions. And I could give other examples too. Could I mention one last thing in this regard? 
the Standing International Forum of Commercial Courts was mentioned by Lord Leggett in his opening remarks. When that community of 40 jurisdictions with commercial courts, and it includes Canada and the Netherlands, I'm delighted to say, alongside England and Wales, gathers together. Not only is the subject of user engagement central, but in fact, there's always a session for users to inform that community of 40 jurisdictions on the concerns and ideas that come from those we're looking to serve. And underneath it all, if, if you encourage this dialogue, then everybody's focus ends up in exactly the place that Marion was indicating on achieving justice, serving the rule of law. Terrific. Now, um, I've got a very good question, but I'm going to park that because it takes us, for the moment, it takes us back to witness statements. I do want to cover ADR and mediation. I want to understand in a moment, Brad, how out of however many thousand cases, the Canadian courts ensure relatively few come to trial. Marion, would you just set the scene, please, uh, and, and just quickly recap the position under English law in terms of the court's uh, ability and willingness to uh, make ADR techniques compulsory, please. Yes, I will. And with pleasure, Colin. And I'll focus on the commercial court because I think we are seeing a slight divergence at the moment in, in the case law. The approach here has been to treat uh, mediation as voluntary. It's not mandatory, but it is mandatory to think about it and to advise about it. And there are very clear and applied potential adverse costs implications if a successful party can be shown to have unreasonably refused an offer to talk. We've seen the slight build, because there's an increasing use now of uh, a form of judicial neutral evaluation in the family courts. The conferencing with the judge beforehand where indications are given, that has been hugely successful. And we've seen and had just had uh, Sir Geoffrey Boss saying, perhaps the time has come for us to rethink whether or not we take that last step and we say that it is compulsory to go through ADR. Uh, there's obviously going to be, that's an invitation to the profession and to those who use it to put that issue back before the court. And it's going to be very, very interesting to see the answer that's given to it. I. I think it's very close to call. My personal view is that the commercial court won't, but it will continue, continue to, to urge, support, encourage parties to find their own solution for the reasons that everybody on this panel knows. Yeah, thank you. Brad, is the legal position, as, as Marion has superbly summarised it, uh, reflective of the position in the Canadian states and... Uh, uh, could you also tell us the extent to which uh, Canadian courts encourage, if not impose, mediation ADR techniques? Um, in, in our courts, it's not mandatory. Um, I, I would probably agree with Marion that on, on an ethical, professional basis, it's mandatory to think about it. And certainly in case management conferences, the judges will now um, strongly suggest to parties that they engage in judicially assisted dispute resolution that that's where you have a another judge assigned to attempt a mediation with the parties it's it's done on a without prejudice basis uh it's done uh voluntarily but if it's suggested by the judge it's a foolish party who doesn't take up that suggestion um and then you you meet with the judge and and they attempt to resolve it and if it if it's not resolved uh that's not held against anyone because all the discussions are without prejudice um uh, but i think it would be i think it would be difficult to make it mandatory because while you do prepare mediation briefs uh the the jadr judge is not seeing and hasn't seen all of the evidence of, it hasn't been tested by cross-examination yeah. So it, it, I don't think it could be made mandatory, but uh, certainly uh, at all levels of courts, it's, be, it's 
been highly recommended. I know that here in Manitoba, as part of our one judge rule I was talking about before, um, the judge will, without having obviously heard direct examination, cross-examination, and necessarily seen all of the evidence, will give an assessment of the case to the parties as part of the case management, going, I think you might get this, but I don't think you're going to get this. That all has to be taken with a grain of salt because obviously it hasn't, you haven't had the evidence go through trial at that point in time. So, Well, thank you. Um, well, and before I uh, finish with Sir Robin on this, um, it, it ha ha has the Netherlands Commercial Court any experience of, of, of the wisdom or otherwise of encouraging mediation as, as one of the tools in its arsenal? Well, uh, we can suggest it uh, if, the, if there's clear, clear indications that the parties are willing to look uh, at, at options outside of a uh, judgment. Uh, but uh, our experience is that uh, normally when the case go to court, the lawyers already have tried mediation, have tried to agree on a settlement. Uh, so if they go to court, then that's a strong indication that uh, they want to go on. And, uh, we, we feel that it must be voluntary to succeed. Uh, so if you, if you push as a judge, uh, the parties may go through the motions and appear to, 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 to do real mediation, but it only uh, backfires and holds up the yeah. case. Yeah, interesting. I, I always remember about 20, 25 years ago when I first heard of the concept of mediation, and I remember an American lawyer uh, was doing the rounds of law firms in London telling us about this new concept. Uh, and I think my reaction at the time uh, must have been the same as most other people's. That will never catch on here. Uh, and look where we are now. So Robin, I, I don't know if it's fair to ask you your views on this question, but can I start by just asking, you must sometimes be sitting in court thinking, why on earth don't you go and try to mediate this rather than continuing to fight? Is that is that a a thought that goes through the judicial mind from time to time? Yes, it is. Um, and if it does, and um, the circumstances are appropriate, for example, at a case management conference, um, I, I will ask that and I will expect informed answers um, because my job does include encouraging, to the point of strongly encouraging, mediation in an appropriate case. I, like everybody, can see <laughs> <laughs> the picture there of, of Brad. Um, but I'm also conscious, um, uh, as a judge, especially in the commercial court, of, of some other aspects. Um, first of all, that some parties are there because what they need is the authoritative legal answer to a question. Of course, they could resolve a particular dispute, but that doesn't help them. What they want is the answer that can enable a business or a business sector to proceed. And that deserves uh, respect. I'm also conscious that um, compelling mediation sometimes will not give the best start to that process. Yeah. I'm also conscious that the question of mediation is never just whether, it's also when. Yeah. I think the most important thing um, to my mind is that we all, judges, lawyers, and parties, make sure we know all about mediation, that we build the experience we can about mediation, that we respect it as right up there in terms of the forms of dispute resolution alongside litigation and arbitration. Yeah. Because if we do that, uh, then helped perhaps by strong judicial encouragement, uh, we um, have a good chance of calibrating this yeah. correctly. Uh, I must say, put that way, um, it seems to me that judicial, strong judicial encouragement ought to be enough in the vast majority of cases. But uh, let's just see where this develops, as I'm, I'm sure that, as Sir Geoffrey Voss has put it out there, 
that maybe there needs to be a rethink. We just know that there will be a party that in due course will take that point. We have, according to my clock, a minute left, and I just want to quickly um, throw over to Marion a question that's come in from Melanie Hart. Thank you. Um, going back to witness statements, there is an interesting tension between saying on the one hand that settlement is to be encouraged as early as possible, but on the other hand, saying that commentary on documents should be left to trial if it is prohibited in witness statements. I understand one of the options being committed considered as a separate document commentary type filing, which would be helpful, I believe, and help achieve the aim of witness statements returning to their true function. Marion, 30 seconds on that. That's, that's very unfair, isn't it? Not at all. Yes, it is an idea that is being mooted. I think the problem is you're going to be shifting the costs from one bucket into another. And I think the sweet spot for settling in ADR for yep. most cases is after disclosure before we get on to these next expensive steps. Wow, that was a fantastic answer. Um, uh, let me wrap up with these comments. What a pity we haven't had two hours because uh, there is so much more we could have discussed and expanded. But uh, thank you, panelists, uh, all of you, for keeping to uh, my request to keep answers succinct succinct and brief. I think you've done a fabulous job. I hope the audience agrees. Um, things to pick up. Um, uh, I certainly would like to hear more about the Canadian and Dutch experience. Marion, I did manage to get a copy of 57 AC last night. I had the same trouble as you. I will flick it over to you. Um, interestingly, it's very long. Um, it's about 12 pages. Um, length of most witness statements, actually, but there we are. Um, uh, but it would be wonderful if uh, we could pick, pick up some of the experiences here. Before I hand over, I think, to my president, the Law Society president, I'm supposed to say, just before handing over to Simon and Amanda Pinto, QC for closing remarks, to remind everyone that there is a networking session starting at 2.40 in about nine minutes. So I'm going to shut up uh, and just say thank you again, panelists, superb. Uh, Simon, Amanda, over to you for any closing remarks, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Colin. Uh, and thank you very much to the audience, because uh, I've been watching the figures and I can see that just about everybody who, who started um, earlier today are still there. Uh, two incredibly high quality sessions run in such a stimulating and provocative way by Stephen and by Colin, who frankly, you, you both made it look so sort of Roger Federer-like easy that actually you hid, I know, the huge amount of work that both the two of you had to do before. And thank you very much indeed for the, 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 the panelists, uh, who are, I'm probably now inadvertently going to be rude about other panels that I've witnessed, but what I loved about the two sessions today was that you avoided the platitude you all focused on uh, practical issues and you didn't all just agree with each other, which was a, a real treat. And that, again, probably down to the, the, the clever probing of, of our two uh, panel leaders. Um, in relation to, I thought, well, an interesting remark made in the first panel by uh, Richard Suskind uh, about the need for data. And we've, we can, we've heard from a number of the contributors that there are, there are certain kinds of data out there, but they're not necessarily the right kind of data which we need to inform the decisions for the future. So I think my perception of what we just heard is that there is a need for some kind of forum where we can be sharing the kind of data about what has worked, what are going to be the kinds of hearings which really go well with videos, which don't, where does it all fit in? I think it's a real opportunity here to make sure that the learning which is being gathered around the world is harnessed to the good of uh, those who aren't able to access justice. We've heard some very low statistics and those who are not uh, able to, um, to receive the warm embrace of the rule of law. So thank you very much to all of you and thank you very much to all of you who've been listening. Amanda. Thank you very much, Simon. And thank you also from me to all our excellent panellists and chairs. What, what I think our sessions have demonstrated is that when we think about changing or improving how best to operate commercial courts, or indeed any courts, uh, we must have at the heart of those changes access to justice for those who need to use the courts. Um, 
and the rule of law. And if the costs are too high, or the delays are too long, or if you use technology or you don't use technology in ways that undermine that accessibility and the quality of the process, then we've got to reassess. Um, I hope that the conversations today have given everyone some inspiration on how we can all improve the quality of justice for our clients. And I think perhaps we all know what the secret weapon to successful persuasive tools in the commercial court is and that is a noisy and gorgeous feline junior. I do hope uh, that many of you will be joining us for the virtual networking session beginning in six minutes. Uh, as Colin mentioned, um, we've all become pretty proficient at uh, these seminars and now's the opportunity to become even more proficient with a virtual glass in your hands. So, I hope you enjoy the networking. Thank you all very, very much for attending. Uh, I think it's been a wonderful uh, part of our opening of our legal year. <laughs>